The Lord is here. It is surely to us. Come and celebrate our common home. We have our family of humanity. With the mountains, islands, and deserts. We honor the glory of God in creation. With the lakes, rivers, and seas. We come to the source of living water. With the land, its soil, seeds, and sustenance. We give thanks for God's generous provision. With the forests of green trees, the lungs of the planet. We will sing with joy and clap our hands. We join with the whole of creation, inspired by those who have gone before and the prophetic voices of today. We dare to praise and pray for another possible world. Would you please be seated? I was watching a bit of television the other day about the previous exploratory journey to Mars. Got what it's called now. It was, it was there for 15 years, this little buggy wandering around drilling holes and things and doing experiments and sending back information. And there was this one scientist, a NASA scientist, who was, he couldn't contain himself with joy because he said they found that there was oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, water, all the things you need for life. He was really excited about this. And I thought, yeah, but there isn't any, is there? <laughs> there aren't any little green men wandering around saying, oh, you're living one, aren't you? And when people talk about the possibility of living on Mars, they're talking about massive, massive programs that will cost billions and billions of dollars to keep a few people alive in this very hostile environment. By contrast, to bring life to some of our impoverished parts of this planet, can be really cheap. You know, putting a, a well in to give water, building a dam, costs maybe a few hundred pounds in our money. And you think, it's all very well looking at what's on Mars, and it's interesting science, and I'm sure there'll be useful byproducts. but let's get real. We're not going to live there. We have about four billion times better chance of making this planet keep us alive than we have of making that red one. We need to wake up. So we continue with our theme of praise and say together these verses from Psalm 96 on the bottom of the first page. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for the joy before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Well, this coming judgment is something which the psalmist is looking forward to. Let the earth rejoice because God is coming to judge the world. And that's because he was confident that those who loved God would get a good judgment, a good result. How many of you used to enjoy or do enjoy exams at school? Hands up if you enjoy exams. <laughs> Two. Very good. Two out of 18. <laughs> we need to work on this, don't we, as a society. People in the Old Testament talk quite a lot about the judgment of the Lord in positive terms because they were confident that they were living according to God's will. I suspect that we feel a little less confident than they did now. And part of what we're doing in our service today is the next section, which is to lament, a prayer of lament. A lament is a sense of sorrow for things that have gone wrong or died or passed away. So just listen to this prayer. O oh God, the heavens are not glad. The earth does not rejoice. Warming gases fill the atmosphere. Pollution turns clean air foul. Climate breakdown wreaks havoc. The sea roars with the grief of all the plastic that fills it of the destruction of coral reef. The fields exclaim despair for delayed rains and prolonged drought for species becoming extinct on a daily basis. 
No song of joy rings out from the trees of the forest decimated by fire. How long, O oh God, how long until your justice comes for all your creatures and the earth? In you we put our trust. Amen. Amen. So seeing the contrast between the glory of God's creation and the ways in which we have marred it, we move to confession, to say sorry for the things that we've done wrong. And we're saying sorry, not only as individuals, but on behalf of our whole race. For the beauty of the earth desecrated by pollution, extinguished by fires, choked by plastic waste, Christ our God, to you we plead, Forgive us for systemic grief. The urgency of this hour ignored by apathy or procrastination, wasted by ineffective decisions, denied by economic interests. Christ our God and Saviour, forgive us for selfish, short-term behaviour. For the joy of human love, fractured by forced migration, crushed by bereavement, lost to typhoons, floods, starvation. Christ our God, bringer of justice, forgive us for this climate crisis. Let's pray together. God, God you know us. us. You know that we can be loving and kind. And you know that sometimes we get things wrong. We're sorry for the times we hurt other people. Forget to listen to you. May God forgive us, may Jesus bless us, may God's Spirit help us to grow in love. Amen. Please remain seated and we'll have our reading. Listen, my people, I need to talk with you. I have questions. I need answers. I have cared for you. I rescued you from slavery. I gave you wise leaders, both women and men. You need to remember the stories of who I am and what I have done. Listen, my people. I am talking to those of you who live in the countryside. I am questioning those of you who live in cities and towns. What have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Speak, the mountains are listening to you. The earth is waiting to hear your voice. What can I do? What can I bring to God? What does God want of me? What will keep God happy? What will keep God off my back? Would God be impressed with barrels and barrels of olive oil? Would God be satisfied with thousands of animals from my flocks? Perhaps my riches are not enough. Should I offer to God the life of my precious firstborn child? Listen, mortal. Listen to what God says. Look carefully at how God acts. Remember the stories of what God has done. God has shown you clearly what is bad and what is good. You are to do justice and act fairly. Do justice in the home and in the street and in the marketplace. Do justice in your community. Work with others to do justice globally. Do justice with strangers and friends and family alike. You are to love kindness. You are to be generous. You are to share your resources and share them with a smile. You are to care for those in need. You are to walk humbly with God. No pretense, no bluster. You are to walk wisely and purposefully. You are to pray and wonder. You are to respect the earth. You are to experience and learn who is God and what God is about. Listen up, mortal. 
God has told you what is good. Don't do it. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. This is my command, love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you please be seated? Christian Aid Week starts uh, during this week and focuses on stories. So, and we're going to hear two stories today. One is about a woman called Rose and another one called Florence, and they are in, in Kenya. And the climate crisis is having a significant impact on communities in Kenya. The main problem being the lack of access to a reliable source of water. And that's needed to withstand the unpredictable weather made worse by climate change. The weather has become more extreme. Drought has become more frequent and intense, resulting in millions of people being short of food as they are unable to grow crops. In parts of Kenya last year, the drought was followed by relentless rainfall and flooding, which damaged the few crops that had struggled to grow. With no access to reliable water or a way to capture rainfall, many communities are struggling to survive. Made, of course, any more difficult by the corona pandemic. In Kitua County, eastern Kenya, eight out of ten people depend on water to grow crops, for food and to earn a living. So Rose is caught up in a cycle of climate chaos from severe drought to flooding. Extreme weather robs her of what she needs to survive, a reliable source of water. She says, when I was a young girl, there was plenty of food, but now the rains are unreliable. The climate crisis has galvanized extreme weather and Rose's community feel the brunt of it. I often feel hungry, she says, I worry a lot about food. I pray to God that the rainfall become normal, like it used to be. And in times of drought, she sets out on a long and dangerous journey every morning to collect water for her family. And she walks on an empty stomach. She walks under stabbing pains of hunger and under the hot sun. But she says, if I give up, my grandchildren will hunger and thirst. With a dam full of water, Rose would be free from her long, painful journeys, and she'd have time to grow fresh vegetables for her family to eat. Which brings us to Florence. Florence is full of life and love and laughter. A few years a day after her husband died, she was left a widow, and she had no water to grow crops. Her children were hungry, and she had to walk for hours on dangerous journeys. But then things changed. Next to her farm, Florence is proud to show us something remarkable. 
a dam full of fresh water. It's thanks to people who donated to Christian Aid and other charities that this community has been able to have a dam built just a short walk away from their village. With this, Florence can grow tomatoes and onions and chilies on her farm. The children can eat healthy, nutritious vegetables. It's her source of life and joy. And she also uses the water to keep bees, from which she produces rich golden honey, which she sells at the market. The dam gives Florence strength to withstand even the most unpredictable weather. It's a reliable source of water whether she faces drought or relentless rain. The stories tell us what can be done. And it's a million times, billions of times cheaper and easier than going to Mars. Christian Aid has long encouraged the church to find sources of hope like this so that we might be inspired to take, on, take action on the causes and consequences of climate change. The biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann shows us one of the tasks of such prophecy is to inspire our imagination, to offer an alternative vision in which the earth might be a different and better place, and then live that envisioned world into reality. Micah was one of those biblical prophets, and I think it's fascinating to hear that reading modernized into our own kind of language, and to see how modern his message seems even now. If someone writing thousands of years ago before greenhouse gas emissions had anything to contribute as a source of hope and imagination for action on the climate crisis, we might wonder. And part of the process of prophecy is to name the things that are wrong. Micah begins his prophecy with a message which is intended to be global. Hear you peoples, all of you. Listen, O ye earth, and all that is in it. There is no naming and shaming of individuals, but he does name and shame the corruption of the political leaders and the dishonesty of the merchants and the greed of those who control the use of land. He denounces their exploitation and oppression of people. He sees these social injustices as integral to the idolatry of the people of Israel. So as with Micah, so too climate injustice feeds upon the prolific idolatry and fallen principalities of money, power, self-interest, and the myth of perpetual growth. And it is a myth, isn't it? We've seen tremendous growth in parts of the world, but as always in the past, the growth that comes in one quarter usually gets paid for by another. If we are to imagine the better world presented to us in Micah's prophecy, then we need to begin with the naming and engaging of the systematic powers that have led to the injustices which now mar creation. God requires us to do justice with those who are the worst affected, yet least responsible for climate change. To do justice also requires justice for the earth, to acknowledge that the raging fires and flooding rivers and devastating typhoons are a result of the grave injustice of exploitation and neglect. God also requires us to embody mercy and kindness. While this, of course, demands that we act with compassion for the wounded creation and for its hurting people, it also begs that we may be the more, it also begs what may be the more difficult question, which is how are we to engage the fallen powers in such a way that show redeeming mercy to those who continue to reject the radical changes that are needed. We need to walk humbly. Walking humbly means turning to God in prayer, in continuous and collective prayer for the planet. And to that end, we've been given a little prayer booklet, which you've been given today, 
which we're encouraged to use in our private prayers. So that joining with brothers and sisters across the world in prayer, we can remind ourselves that the earth is the Lord's. And setting our hearts to seek God, we galvanize our courage to do justice, love mercy, as we respond to the challenge and join in the mission of God restoring his earth. And now let us pray. God of abundant life, we see your goodness all around us and we thank you for every part of it. From the plants and animals which play their parts in complex ecosystems, to the dry deserts and stormy seas which test the limits of life. We pray that in this time of climate crisis and ecological emergency, you may help us to rediscover your love of creation and to reflect that in our own lives. God, in your mercy, God, who speaks through unexpected people, we thank you for contemporary prophets who are challenging challenging us to act on climate change, for indigenous people and their invaluable knowledge of the land and sea where they live. For scientists dedicating their careers to warning us about changes to the planet, and for the young people striking for their, for their future. We pray that you will help those in power to hear their prophetic voices. Help them to see beyond short-term political priorities and business plans and give them wisdom and courage when they face difficult decisions. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of second chances, we recognise the damage we have done to the earth and the injustice we see in society every day, all of it fueled by worship of profit and possessions. We pray for the coming of a better world with justice, kindness and humility of this heart. We ask that you guide us to be co-creators of this new world. Give us confidence to follow the prophetic voices, to stand against injustice to people and to planet, so that together, in your strength, we stop this climate crisis. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and on the sea. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and we give us our sins temptation. Until the last of you, the kingdom of God and the Lord of the universe, now and forever.